Hello there! Some of you might remember relatively recently, although it was over a year ago at this point, I reviewed the original Spyro trilogy on the PS1 in the run-up to the Reignited trilogy being released, which I then also reviewed. This has got me thinking though, outside of these initial three games in their remakes, I have never played any of the other Spyro games, so I figured why not fix that? Starting with Spyro Enter the Dragonfly on the PS2. Spyro Enter the Dragonfly was the first console release in the series after Insomniac parted ways with the Purple Dragon, with them wanting to work closer with Sony, who they had developed a good working relationship with. Universal Interactive Studios owned the rights to Spyro and decided the best developer to create the fourth instalment in the series would be two developers, which is never a good sign. These two developers were Czech Six Studios and Equinox Digital Entertainment, and let's just say, development of this game was rocky. This game damaged Spyro's reputation to such a degree that I would say he never really recovered from it. This is probably why I never played any of the PS2 games in the series, and why I didn't get back into it until the Reignited trilogy was released. The primary reason for the unfinished, glitchy, and terribly designed mess that is Enter the Dragonfly is because of Universal pushing the game's development in order to make a holiday release. But there's also reports stating terrible working conditions put onto the developers by Universal, which are further backed up by former employees of Insomniac also saying that their time with Universal was awful too. I'm not going to go into too much detail with this, but even after doing a tiny bit of research, it's easy to see that the failure of this game was not the developer's fault, but Universal's mismanagement of the Spyro brand that caused its downfall. But having said all of that, none of this changes the fact that this game is an absolute train wreck. Right from the get-go in the first introductory cutscene, we can see that the animations and general graphical quality is awful for a PS2 game. I don't know what is going on with the jankiness here, but everything looks really unnatural, and the animations are over-exaggerated to the point where the models almost look like they warp. And I will be happy to demonstrate. Since I've had enough to do with dragons, I thought, perhaps, dragonfly. <laughs> Not only do we have the horrible visuals, but what really got on my nerves was the lack of any consistency with the previous games. Something which had always been really interesting in the original Spyro trilogy was that each game directly continued on from the last and referenced things from the previous game. So when Spyro defeats an enemy like Nasty Nork or Ripto, they don't return in the next game because they're literally dead. Not only that, but Spyro also keeps his abilities from the previous game. So the new powers he gets in Spyro 2, like being able to swim underwater, climb, and head bash, he actually has those powers from the start of Spyro 3. That is, aside from the gem finding ability that Sparks has in Spyro 2, and for some reason has to relearn in Spyro 3. Then we get into the Dragonfly, which kinda just throws any series consistency out of the window by having Ripto inexplicably return and kinda just steal a load of dragonflies for no real reason. And not only that, but have Crush and Gulp return from Spyro 2, but have the ability to talk, which they previously couldn't do. Blasted! Where are they? Where are my dragonflies? Uh, excuse me, oh short one. Uh, sir, sir, short one. Something went wrong with your scepter. Uh, I think the dragonflies were scattered all over. Nasty Nork is mentioned by Ripto despite the two never having met, and Hunter is implied to not know who Ripto is despite them constantly clashing throughout Spyro 2. But then we also have elements where there is consistency, like how Hunter is scared of the sorceress's balloon float because of the events of Spyro 3. Why there's a balloon in the shape of the main antagonist from the third game, I have no idea. Like, why would they be celebrating the villain? Then there's the fact that Spyro keeps his abilities from Spyro 2 and some of the abilities from Spyro 3, like being able to level warp using the Atlas. 
But yet again, the gem finding ability has to be relearned. Why do they keep doing that? The gem finding ability makes the game so much better by making it so you don't waste your time looking for a single gem in a huge sprawling level. They got it right with Spyro 2 where it was available from the start of the game, but since then you get it right at the end when you've probably got most of the gems anyway, making it pointless. It's just stupid design. Anyway, despite it being very poorly set up and it being silly that Ripto appears out of nowhere, the dragonflies being stolen is actually quite a cool concept because they serve as the protectors of the young dragons and so it puts them at risk not having the guardians. It works well because throughout the series we've seen that Sparks is Spyro's health meter, so it's actually worked into the gameplay in an interesting way. It's just a shame that that's hard to appreciate when the surface level story and the way it's presented is awful. But hey, maybe the bad reputation this game has is just down to the introduction and the actual gameplay might be good. Yeah, the game's terrible. From the very beginning of the game, there's like a million different issues that present themselves almost instantaneously, so I guess we kind of have to start the gameplay breakdown by talking about all of that. So firstly, I found it really, really irritating how you're constantly getting interrupted with tutorials for the most basic and obvious things that you could figure out by just playing the game. Like for example, you really don't need to be told what a gem is. I'm sure that even if this was the first video game you had ever played, you would instinctively know to collect them. And this type of thing is just constant. More importantly though, this game controls and plays like a stuttering piece of crap. You know those old cheat codes that activated moon gravity in games like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater? It constantly feels like that's enabled in Enter the Dragonfly. It's just floaty as hell, and even general movement feels loose because there's a delay on every single button input, which makes it feel like you're not directly controlling Spyro, but kinda just guiding him in a general direction. They just didn't get the controls right at all, and this is easily one of the absolute worst things about the entire game. Another horrendous thing that you might have even noticed by this point from the footage I've shown is that the frame rate is really unstable, constantly dipping really randomly even when there's not a lot happening on screen. This is probably the worst frame rate performance I've ever seen in a proper retail released game. It's that bad. So this combined with the control issues? Yeah, it makes for a bad time, let me tell you. These issues alone are enough to make you want to stop playing, but there's even more problems that present themselves the more you play the game. Not that any sane person would continue playing, but then, I guess I'm not a sane person. There's problems all over the place here. The camera movement is inverted and can't be changed, making even the simplest camera adjustment incredibly awkward. You can't even move the camera up or down, which is weird and kind of makes the game feel even more stiff. You can often clip the camera outside of the level bounds and see outside of the game area. There's loads of times where you can run through a tunnel section too fast and enter an area before it's loaded properly, and one time this happened to me and the floor and walls didn't load in for ages. There's also audio glitches with music suddenly going quiet out of nowhere. Hey, it's Karen! And then there's this, where an NPC said dialogue that he wasn't supposed to say at the stage of the game I was at because I didn't have enough collectibles yet. Hello Spyro, you need to collect more of those them air bugs, and I should have this honeycomb raft working like a charm. Well that should do it Spyro, hop aboard the raft and get ready for the honey moss rapids.
There's also times where I got stuck hovering in the air for ages, and then other times where I was just sort of floating across the floor instead of charging, and just countless other things like this that happened. This is easily one of the most unpolished, unfinished, and biggest messes of a game I've ever played. I guess I kinda dodged a bullet by not playing this when I was younger. Not now though. That bullet is hitting me right between the eyes. It's not even just glitches that make this game bad either. Even if all of these glitches were fixed and removed, the game would still be terrible. They just made so many bad choices with the gameplay and level design, and I don't understand why Universal were okay with rushing a product out to this extent. Like how about the fact that rather than just walking up to a collectible to get it, you know, like in practically any other platformer, you have to catch them with bubble breath instead. Now this could have been interesting, Ape Escape used a similar mechanic and that worked amazingly, but the difference there is that Ape Escape is designed entirely around the capturing mechanic, whereas in Enter the Dragonfly it seems kinda tacked on and doesn't even work properly most of the time. So to explain how this works, in order to catch the dragonflies you have to use bubble breath, but when a dragonfly is flying around you, you have to hit it with the breath in a very specific way, otherwise it just straight up won't work. And then picture the dragonfly moving around you at speed while you're suffering through tanking frame rates, moon gravity, delayed controls and an inverted camera, only then will you know hell. If you still don't think the game is that bad, then how about this? There's only 9 levels in the entire game, and that includes the hub world. That's right, the one singular hub world present in the game. Now, if each of these levels were incredible and original, maybe that would be okay. But of course, they aren't incredible or original. In fact, some of them straight up reuse enemies from previous Spyro games. Like the guys from Colossus in Spyro 2, or the Tiki Heads from Idle Springs. Or how about some of the level themes which feel suspiciously similar to ones from previous games too. Like we've got this farm level, which feels kinda oddly similar to Robotica Farms, only far less interesting. Or this level set in the clouds, which feels kinda like, oh I don't know, Cloud Spires from Spyro 3? You know, that level that's also set in the clouds? Or how about a level featuring monks set in a snowy mountainous monastery? Kinda similar to Colossus from Spyro 2, isn't it? You know, that level that's set in a snowy mountain featuring monks in a monastery? It's just straight up lazy, the fact that there's such a low amount of levels and a ton of them are ones we've already seen done a hell of a lot better in previous games, it's kinda despicable. You can imagine a situation where maybe this would be okay if the levels themselves were well designed, but obviously, they're not. What do you think this is, a good game? The issue with this game's levels is that all of them are designed in fundamentally the same way. Having big open flat spaces just filled to the brim with randomly placed gems and enemies that just require you to run around in circles clearing everything out before moving through a tunnel to allow the next area to load. Which by the way the PS1 games didn't need to do. And the next area of the level is always just another big open flat section filled with the same gems and boring enemies. Admittedly there are elements of variety sometimes. There's very few examples of standout variety in the normal levels, but there is some. Like timing jumps to avoid swinging blades, shooting targets with super flame breath before a timer runs out, or sometimes having more vertical sections by having you be underwater or having whirlwinds take you up in a building. But these slightly more interesting elements happen so irregularly that it doesn't really help the game feel any less boring. Annoyingly, Enter the Dragonfly seems to have taken more influence from Spyro 3 rather than 1 or 2, which in my opinion are the better games in the original trilogy. This influence is most clearly seen by the fact that this game features the vortexes that take you to sub-levels within the standard levels. I really don't like this because it breaks the game's worlds up, making them feel more video gamey rather than living worlds. 
And I also don't like it from a gameplay perspective either, because it's annoying to navigate and find gems because you don't know if they're missing in the base level or one of the several sub-levels. Now, you won't hear me say this much during this video, but one way Enter the Dragonfly is actually better than Spyro 3 is in the way that the sub-levels don't feature any gems, so if you're missing a gem, you know it's in the normal level. And while we're on this topic, there's also no other playable characters, which is another reason that I didn't like Spyro 3 as much as 1 or 2, because I feel like it's a less pure experience, and it kinda just felt like the developers were experimenting for the next game, rather than focusing on Spyro. But like I say, that actually isn't the case in Enter the Dragonfly. Most of these sub-levels feature some kind of gimmick. One of the better ideas is these slide sections where you have to win a race or outrun a volcano eruption or beat a timer as you slide down a huge obstacle course. And I have to say, this kind of actually controls okay if you can get past the input delay. Then we also have some stinkers though, like the plane and tank sections where you have to destroy targets or a number of enemies, and these just feel really uninspired and dull, and they don't control very well either. Luckily they're short, so it's not too bad, and I will say it's nice to have some variety injected into the game like this too. There's also other gimmicks like a memory drumming game or these tower platforming challenges and this pretty cool ladder climbing section too. So all in all, I actually think this is the first true positive thing I have to say about the game. It actually does have quite a fair bit of variety, but it's just disappointing how this variety isn't integrated into the actual levels and instead is separated into the vortex sub areas. Even the time trial flying levels make the return in this game, but instead of being their own full level, they're just found within these sub areas. And I actually kinda like this. I mean, I would rather the game not have sub areas to begin with, but if you're gonna have them, you might as well put the flying levels in there, right? Okay, so I've gone on and on about the negatives of the game, and believe me, I could continue. Like how about this, Moneybags returns in this game, but he's in it literally one single time and only asks for 200 gems, and then he's never seen again. Some people might be praising the Lord for this because everybody hates Moneybags, but he actually serves an important purpose, which is to make the gems actually worth collecting, because they do something. Without money bags, there's literally no reason to collect gems because they aren't used to progress the story or unlock levels, so they're a completely pointless object that you're collecting for no reason other than to see a number go up. You should never, ever have a pointless collectible like this in a platformer, because the whole point is the constant feeling of progression and reward, and if a collectible doesn't achieve this, it might as well not be there. But anyway, enough of that, before I get sidetracked again, let's talk about some more aspects of Enter the Dragonfly I actually like, because despite everything, there is a couple of things I think are interesting. The main way Spyro becomes more powerful in this game, and also the way it introduces a slight amount of backtracking is through the ability to learn different elemental breath attacks. By finding runes hidden in certain levels, you'll learn ice breath, bubble breath, electric breath, and gain a wing shield. This is a really interesting idea and it could have been implemented in a really cool way by having some enemies be weak to different attacks or having multiple ways to progress through a level depending on which breath you have, and stuff like that. But unfortunately, despite genuinely being a cool idea, it's just not implemented very well into the levels. There's pretty much one set use for each of the abilities and it's never used outside of this one example for the most part. Like, the wing shield is literally only used to defeat these magicians, and it doesn't even work properly most of the time, which caused me massive frustration. The ice breath is used to beat these robots, and also for literally three times in the same level to stand on a baby dragon's head to get a kite. And the electric breath is used to activate mechanical contraptions, which are only present in about two levels, and don't really ever do anything besides either progress the level or make a platform move a bit. It's just disappointing seeing this cool idea that's not put to any interest in use. It's also cool how Spyro says the name of every dragonfly that you rescue with an actual line of dialogue. You can rarely tell though that at a certain point they are running out of name ideas, because they begin using really obscure ones, or just straight up made up ones. Hey, it's Pre 
Commissioner Murphy. <laughs> hey, it's Ice Boy. So yeah, there's way more detail I could go into, but I think I've covered all of the main points. It's a terrible game with very, very few redeeming features at all. Even the loading times are really long and you just have to sit there staring at Spyro wiggling his bum at you for upwards of 40 seconds every single time. So you've rescued most of the dragonflies and unlocked the last boss. Well, I say last boss, the only boss in the game. And I say unlocked it, it just randomly opens up with no cutscene or dialogue bringing any attention to it. I have no idea when I actually unlocked the boss fight because I just straight up wasn't told. So that's nice. Anyway, you unlock it and the fight against Ripto kinda just starts, with no cutscene and just an incredibly awkward bit of dialogue, which doesn't make any sense because it implies that you've already fought Ripto before. Which, I guess you have in Spyro 2, but the implication seems to be that you've fought him in this game before, which I hadn't. You're back again? How is this possible? I will take care of you permanently! You oh, wait a minute, I said that last time. I wouldn't want to sound like a video game cliché. Then the fight begins and it's really not at all obvious what you need to do because there's no animation or anything when you hit Ripto. So I died a couple of times before figuring out that you simply have to breathe fire on his ice shield a few times. The idea being that you have to dodge projectiles while doing it, but if you move quick enough you can just keep hitting him without him getting the chance to shoot you at all. After that he then creates a fire shield and you use the ice breath against him, doing the exact same thing. Then that's it. He has one more bit of dialogue saying he'll be back, and it literally just fades to the credits. There's not even an ending cutscene or anything. That's it. When I witnessed this, my jaw dropped. That is such an abrupt ending, if you can even call it that. The very least I expected from this game was some sort of resolution, but no. It couldn't even give me that, could it? Because I'm an absolute maniac, I actually went to the trouble of getting 100% on this game. Because if I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna do it to its fullest. And what I discovered was that by getting 100%, you actually unlock a third phase of the boss fight, where Ripto transforms himself into a big mutant, and you actually do need to dodge his attacks this time. And then hit him with electric breath when he gets tired. This would have been an actual, very slightly decent boss fight if it wasn't for one major thing. The camera doesn't lock onto Ripto during this fight, meaning that when you move to run away from his attacks, the camera moves with you and then you can't see what the hell is doing, which basically forces you to get hit. Why they couldn't have just have made the camera lock onto the boss like it does in the other Spyro games, I have no idea. But yeah, it completely ruins the fight. Anyway, you get past that, and you actually get an ending cutscene. That's nice, isn't it? You only need to go to the trouble of getting 100% for the honour of seeing it. So Ripto is beat yet again, returning to his normal form. He says you haven't heard the last of him and returns home, I guess. Spyro, Hunter, Sparks and Bianca are then celebrating the return of the Dragonflies. Then Hunter says this. Well, everything is finally back to normal. Isn't it Spyro? So, what's the message here? Why does Hunter ask this, and why does Spyro wink as a response? I thought the entire point of the game was sending things back to normal, so why would Hunter feel the need to ask this question, and why does Spyro wink as if everything isn't back to normal? It literally makes no sense. I spent all of this time unlocking this ending, and it just raises even more questions. Ridiculous. I'm giving Spyro Enter the Dragonfly a 3 out of 10. Given the amount of negative things I have to say about the game, you might find this a bit surprising. But even though it's quite clearly the worst Spyro game made up until now, I feel like because it sticks to the classic formula so closely, it's still reasonably satisfying to go through. It's basically an extremely watered down version of Spyro 3 that doesn't look as good or run as well and is worse in 
in almost every single way. I would say that the only reason anyone should ever check this out for themselves is if you're a huge fan of Spyro and want to have experienced all of the games. Other than that though, there's practically no reason to ever play this over the original trilogy, and I doubt that I'm ever going to play it again. It has interesting ideas with the elemental breaths, and I like the base idea of rescuing dragonflies. I also appreciate some of the small things, like how there's no gems in the sub-areas, and how Spyro says all of the names of all of the dragonflies too. And plus, with all of the stuff to do in the sub-areas, the game actually does have a fair amount of variety too. But the almost non-existent storyline which creates plot holes with the previous games, the bland and uninspired levels, the terrible controls and camera, the constantly struggling frame rate, and just the so obviously unfinished state the game was released in, severely let it down. Next up in my two-part Spyro mini-marathon, we've got the fifth game released in the series, and the last console game released in the original series continuity. Spyro, A Hero's Tale. Now, I probably know even less about this one going into it than what I did about Enter the Dragonfly, so this one should be fairly interesting. I just hope that the developers learned from the mistakes made in Enter the Dragonfly, and create a game that's more closely matching the quality of the original games, but I guess we'll have to see. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, give it a like, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Bye!